what we're seeing, of course, is lots of patients with COVID in the hospital. But unlike the start of the pandemic or even last year, we're seeing that uh, many of the patients are in with COVID, but not necessarily because of COVID. So that's a bit of a change. And I think that has a lot to do with the degree of immunity in the population, both by natural infection as well as uh, prior vaccination. We're making those decisions almost on a day-by-day -day basis. And we're looking at our hospital capacity. We're looking at our, our really our overall ability to care for the patients that are coming in the door. And so that is a day-by-day -day decision. So at the moment, we, we think we can handle that, but uh, that may change. In some cases, I wouldn't say we're overwhelmed with it. We do have a test that we do that can test for COVID as well as both types of circulating flu uh, strains through uh, A and B. Uh, we, so we've seen some of it, but I, I can't say we're overwhelmed with it right now. Start with the S word, that's sotrovimab. And this is one of the monoclonal antibodies that we have been using really for at least the last year. So for people who have uh, COVID, they maybe have some illness, but not sick to the point that they require oxygen. And in particular, they're at risk to get severe COVID because of immunocompromise or because their age, and particularly those who haven't been vaccinated. If we can arrange for them to get this infusion, an intravenous infusion, we know that that reduces the chance that they'll get sick requiring hospitalization and death. So this new medicine, sotrovimab, it simply takes over from the previous monoclonal antibodies that we were using uh, because sotrovimab is active not only against, um, it's against the, the new variant, Omicron, as well as the previous variants. Omicron has now become the dominant uh, uh, variant throughout the country and certainly in the Philadelphia area. Evasheld is a little bit different. It's, it's an, an injectable monoclonal antibody given intramuscularly, like a, like a flu shot or something, rather than intravenously. And it hangs around a long time and it binds, it provides longstanding protection against COVID. And, and it's really designed for people who are first not sick with COVID, they haven't been diagnosed with COVID, but at risk for COVID because for example, they have an immune deficiency, like somebody who's gotten a transplant or somebody who is on an immunosuppressive medication. So we're just designing and figuring out the logistics of how to identify these individuals and then to administer it. We do have them, but the, the, the limits that we have are number one, the, the actual supply of medication, but also similarly is the challenge of actually the staffing that we need to actually administer them. Both of those are, create a challenge. The emergency rooms are just chock full throughout the region and probably throughout the country, quite frankly. You know, antibody tests, the, the ones that are on the market and, and can be done by, by themselves, they're becoming more difficult to purchase because of course everybody wants them. There are various testing sites set up at, at Jefferson and elsewhere as well as at, at pharmacies and so forth, but it, it can be a challenge. It just depends on where you live as to what the availability of testing will be. I think in general, particularly if you're not in healthcare or in, a, in, a, in an urgent kind of position and you're otherwise young and healthy, um, you know, getting tested, doing a self-home test would be good. I, I think most of the tests, in fact, all the tests on the market uh, that people can do self-administer, they're an antigen test. They actually measure for a specific viral protein that is pretty accurate, generally speaking, when people have symptoms. So they're all pretty good, I think. Uh, there's some question that they may not be quite as accurate for people with the Omicron variant, which of course is the predominant one, but I think overall they're still really quite accurate. hard to answer that question. I'm not sure I can. We think that the most accurate place to test is what's called the nasopharynx. Now, most people, you just can't do that. The nasopharynx is, you know, putting a, a swab that it goes not just in your nose, but all the way back to the back of the throat. The, the swabs that come with these kits are really not designed to do that. So conceivably, we might not find virus in the nose, but we might find it way, way in the back if you do a really careful sampling of the pharynx all the way back in the throat. So that's certainly possible. I haven't heard much about that, but it certainly could be, uh, I can understand why that could happen. 
I've not heard of that, but here's what we know so far with the Omicron. For people, let's say people who've been uh, gotten just one, uh, two doses, their initial vaccination, we know that uh, just with those two shots, that uh, the, the vaccination is not as effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. In other words, getting COVID and get symptoms from it. But the two shots even remain quite effective in reducing the chances of hospitalization, as well as reducing the chance of getting into the intensive care unit. We know that with a single booster, that, that protection goes up even farther in preventing or reducing the chances of hospitalization and intensive care. Now we have new evidence, perhaps from these other countries, especially Israel, that we may have even a bigger benefit, at least in preventing symptomatic infection. I don't know if they're gonna provide any additional benefit yet in terms of hospitalization and once again, intensive care. So I think the jury is still out about that. Uh, obviously we still have a, a lot of people to catch up just to do, even do primary vaccination yeah. as well as the first booster vaccination. So I think thinking beyond that at the moment is worth thinking, but it's probably not the highest priority. I, I think even at the start of the pandemic, we realized that uh, the people are most infectious, by far most infectious from around two days prior to symptom onset, perhaps to out to day seven or eight. Um, but especially now with a highly vaccinated population of especially healthcare workers, healthcare workers that are in short numbers. I mean, we're really struggling with personnel. Uh, we think that the, the guidance of improving symptoms with vaccination, especially with boost, improving certainly by day five, and then masking when they come back, I think their risk of transmitting is probably low. We have to balance the need for our staff to care for these patients because we have to do that with the, with the potential for uh, transmission. So I, I, I think th this is probably striking a reasonable balance in my view. Well, I, I think the most optimistic thing that I can see or have seen is that for the countries way ahead of the Omicron curve, especially South Africa, it's gone up very, very quickly, the numbers, and it's starting to come down equally quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you look at the test positivity rate around now the country, especially in the Philadelphia area, it's very, very high. Almost, almost half of people who get tested are positive. So we're seeing this tremendous uh, upsurge in cases, which means that you know, once, once we've seen this spread of, of, of Omicron COVID around the, around the region, uh, we'll have even a much higher degree of immunity and, um, and we'll start to see things come down, I, I sense fairly quickly and probably before the end of January, which is great. Um, I also think, I, I think there's good reason to think that Omicron is a bit less severe and causes less severe illness. Um, and, and so I think that should be encouraging as well.